Okay, here you go. I got a question. Who in here just loves to be around fake, dishonest, unfaithful friends? <laughs> Anyone? Nobody? Okay, okay, okay. Who in here loves to be around people who are honest, encouraging, life-giving, authentic? Who loves being around those kind of people? Okay, okay, that's what I thought. I thought. Here you go. Imagine with me for a second. Imagine your life filled with a community of people who love you and you love them. Come on. A community that's making a difference together. Let's dream even bigger. Let's dream even bigger. Imagine a community that's diverse. Different upbringings, different views, different opinions, yet very much united in the love of Jesus. Imagine a community of people who eat together, drink together. Come on, somebody. Come together under the love of Jesus and celebrate the goodness of his grace in our lives. Imagine community the way Jesus intended it to be. And we know. All the craziness in our, in our world, even as we go to celebrate Independence Day tomorrow, our country is so divided. There's so much division, so much anger, so much pain going on. A community of diversity, of true diversity, seems like it's impossible. Seems like it would be impossible. <clears throat> My senior pastor, Pastor Andy from Virginia Beach, told me, hey, get that high-quality Wegmans water. Different than the food line. Um, my senior pastor from Virginia Beach told me before sending us out to start this church, he said, Jacob, if you want to grow your church fast, make it all African-American or make it all Caucasian. But if you want to grow a church that will reflect the beauty of heaven, do the hard work to make it a diverse church. Do the hard work to make it a diverse church. So here at the local, we're just actually crazy enough to believe that our church can represent the beauty of heaven. It can represent the beauty of heaven in a diverse community with people from different backgrounds, different views coming together to worship Jesus and make our world a better place. So here you go. Last week, we started a series called Slow It Down Summer, where we've been looking at three spiritual practices to help us become better followers of Jesus. And like I mentioned last week, we've been let down. We have been let down. We have been let down by a Christian faith that teaches us that God is a genie in a bottle and you got to rub him the right way. A Christian faith that says Jesus is supposed to follow you instead of us following Jesus. We've been let down by our own willpower, thinking we can do hard things, impossible things by ourselves and our own strength. And because we've been let down by this Christian faith and because our willpower can never take us to the freedom we truly desire, the problem that comes is I keep doing the things I don't want to do. I keep doing the things I don't want to do, which translates to I'm not living the life I've always wanted. I'm not living the life I always wanted. So what is our solution? <laughs> How do we stop doing the things I don't want to do so that I can live the life I always wanted? The solution I see through Scripture is simple, yet very challenging, especially in our hurry, 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 on-the-go culture that we have. And that solution is to spend daily time with God. Spend daily time with God. Here enters spiritual practices. Because Jesus invites us not to just be Christians, not to just be Christians, but Jesus invites us to be followers of him, students of him, apprentices of him his way. Jesus says it like this in Mark 8. He said, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And Jesus, unlike any other Jewish rabbi in that time, gives an open invitation to every single person, men, women, children, poor, rich, no matter what diverse as can be, he says, come follow me. Come follow me and learn from me. Jesus gives us this invitation, and the best way to follow Jesus is to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do the stuff Jesus did. Do the stuff Jesus did. So our church, the local vineyard, we're entering a season of really learning what that means and, and, and how to not just be another church that will just grow on the corner of the street or in our area, 
but to be a church that's producing a community of people who are following the way of Jesus. Following the way of Jesus. So we're going to look at three spiritual practices that will help us do that. And the first one we're going to look at today is community and why community matters. Now, it might be funny to think, uh, think that hanging out with people is a spiritual practice. It might be kind of funny to think about it that way. Having friends is actually one of the most spiritual things you can do. And I think oftentimes when we think about spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines, we think about being in our prayer closet for hours at a time. We think about reading scripture that we don't understand the context of what's actually happening. And so we, so we think a lot of times we think of spiritual disciplines, we think of more isolated events, more isolated events. But being around a good community of Jesus followers is one of the most important things you can do with your spiritual life. It's one of the most important things you can do. Because here's the thing. The way you love people is a direct reflection of how much you love God. The way you love people is a direct reflection of the way you love God. So I'm going to give us five reasons why community matters and and why this spiritual practice is something that we can do, okay? Reason number one is this. We need faithful friends in every season of life. Come on, can I get an amen with that one? We need faithful friends in every season of life. Now, as we all know, life comes in many different seasons. Did you know that? (laughs) Life comes in good seasons, bad seasons, in-between seasons, ugly seasons, ugly sonic seasons. Ugly sonic? No? Okay, I have kids. Okay, I watch too much cartoons. All right. Faithful friends celebrate in the good seasons of life. And faithful friends comfort in the bad seasons of the life. Faithful friends celebrate in the good seasons of life, and a faithful friend comforts in the bad seasons. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Romans 12, 15. Celebrate with those who celebrate and weep with those who grieve. I love this. I love this. I think this is so important for us to do. Now I want to ask you this. How good are you at celebrating with others? How, How good are you at celebrating with others? Like in our culture today, it's easy to compare yourself, isn't it? especially because of social media, you know, people can take the best picture of, of them, and you think to yourself, man, only if I look like that, or only if I have that. Like, like, for example, you'll see someone on social media, and they'll post a picture about their weight loss, and they have, like, before and after a picture in their weight loss, and then, you're, and then you're, you'll look at it and, and say, wow, they lost all that weight because they did a keto? Oh, that's cool. They're going to gain all that back as soon as they eat some pasta. And then in the comment, you write, you go, girl. <laughs> it's like, it's like, what is weird? It's really weird. Social media is really weird. Okay, so, so like, like what? Like, like, like we, we got to be good at celebrating people the way Jesus was good at celebrating people. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 puts it this way. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others, come on, will be refreshed. Will be refreshed. And healthy Jesus following communities. You want to know what's the difference between a healthy Jesus following community in an unhealthy Jesus following community, because there are plenty of those going around. But in a healthy following Jesus community, you know what we do? We pray for each other regularly. We regularly pray for each other. See, I encourage you to have friendships with people who love to pray with you. And if you don't have any friends who love to pray with you, I'll be your friend and I love to pray. I'll love to pray with you. I encourage you to do that. We, we live in a world that you can get a 30-second TikTok counseling appointment, and they will diagnose all your childhood trauma in one 30-second video. But come on, man, we need to get around people who are loving Jesus and praying for you and understanding. Here you go. When you get around healthy Jesus-following people, they will understand that they can't fix you, but they can help point you to the one who can. Like, like if you get around someone who's always giving you their good advice, advice is good, and that is fine, and give out some good advice. But sometimes good advice is unwanted advice when people's hearts aren't ready to receive it. And so one of the best things that we can do is point people to Jesus. That was good. <laughs> so, 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 so now, now, I'm not talking about having a weekly prayer meeting with your friends. You could, I guess. That's what you want to do. But... But I'm talking about being intentional about praying for others. If you know a friend of yours is going through a hard time in their marriage, with their kids, at, 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 with their health, with their, with their work, with their profession, it's good to talk to them. Yeah, talking is good, but pray for them. Pray for them. And, you should, and when should you pray for people? You should pray for people in person, right then and there. Like, like don't do this. We've all done this. We've all done this. We're all guilty of this one. 
someone tells you something kind of bad or something, something they're going through, and you say, yeah, man, I'll pray for you. You, you. you went home, you ain't prayed for them one time. You know you didn't. You forgot after you started watching the football game or something, you know? Like, like no, when should you pray for them? Right then and there. Right then and there, pray for them. Um, when, we, when we were doing our winter small group, this, our men's small group this, this past winter, which are, I'm excited for our summer one that's starting this Tuesday, uh, what we would do, we, we would do a thing called Happies and Crappies, and everyone would kind of share, all the guys would share a good thing for the week, a, a crappy thing for the week. And if someone shares something that was kind of tough, we wouldn't wait to the end of the small group to pray. We'll say, okay, hey, let's stop what we're doing right now, and let's pray right now, right in the middle of Starbucks. And we'll just pray for people because it's that important to pray for people. Here you go. Comparing tears down. Prayer uplifts. Comparing to each other tears people down. That's why our world is so divided. That's one of the reasons why our world is so divided. People are just always comparing themselves to other people and not being happy who God made them to be. And, 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 but when, when you compare, you just tear down. But when you pray, oh, come on, you change things. Prayer changes things. I want you to know that God doesn't just have like this master plan and this map of plan that he has going and we're just supposed to follow along like good little peasants. Did you know that when you pray, you touch the heart of God and you can change history? I'm about to get, I'm about, you didn't know that, so I'm about to get up in on this. Did you know that when you pray, that you pray to the God who hears your prayers and that God who hears your prayers will take your prayers, he will take your requests, and you can change history through prayers. See, prayers are not something that we just do before we eat McDonald's. Prayer is not something we just do at the end of the night before in our, by our bed. Prayer is how we actively engage with the God who's actively engaged with us right now. Prayer changes things. If you're stuck in a habit, if you're stuck in a place you don't want to be, my question to you will be, have you prayed about it? If you got time to worry about it, stress about it, get all crazy up about it, you got time to pray about it. Prayer changes things. And being in a healthy, godly community, you can have people around you praying for you, lifting you up. You're not meant to do this life alone. Also, in healthy Jesus-following communities, we regularly check up on each other. We need to regularly check up on each other. What do I mean by this? You, if you have a friend who's trying to accomplish something, ask them about it. Shoot them a text message. Next time you see them, talk to them about it. Whatever you do, don't wait for the Facebook update. Come on, man. Don't wait for the Facebook update. Talk to them personally. The, the, a couple, I mentioned this story a couple of weeks ago. The summer, Erin was pregnant with our son, Jameson. She tripped and she broke her arm. It was, it was really scary. We, didn't, you know, we thought she fell on her stomach, but she ended up being okay, obviously, because Jameson's running around everywhere now. But, uh, but the thing that helped Erin the most was the friends who regularly checked up on her. Were friends who regularly checked up on her. They couldn't fix her broken arm, of course, but they could encourage her spirit. But they did encourage your spirit. So you might not be able to fix everyone's problem. You probably can't fix anyone's problem, to be honest. But you can uplift people's spirits. You can uplift people's spirits. We have friends drop off dinners, and Aaron's best friend from Virginia Beach surprised us by sending her 12 delicious chocolate chunk cookies from Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. See, I encourage you to be the cookie friend. Don't assume there's another cookie friend. You be the cookie-sending friend to people. If you know someone in distress, if you know someone that's going through something, and you may say to yourself, well, no one ever sends me cookies. That's okay. God's going to send you cookies in heaven one day. You're going to have a mountain of cookies. I don't know if that's biblical, but I just said it. But you be the cookie-sending friend. You look for the person in need and be someone that brings encouragement. Because the way, oh, come on, the way we love people, the way we celebrate people is a direct reflection of how we worship God. Let me say that to you one more time. The way we love people, the way we celebrate people is a direct reflection on how we worship God. And so if you if, if your expectations with people are always you want someone to give to you, give to you, give to you, the way you worship God is, God, you better give to me. The way you love people, celebrate people, is a direct reflection on the way you worship 
God. So friends, I ask you, treat people how you would treat Jesus. And some of you, the way you're treating people is the way you're treating Jesus. Reason number three, why community matters. Community matters because community helps us learn how forgiven we truly are. Community helps us learn how forgiven we truly are. When you work with people, what's one thing you know when you work with people? People are messy. People are messy. One, one thing I want to make abundantly clear about our church community, people will offend you. People in this church, will, we are a diverse community, so not everyone has the same political views, same, I, this is going to happen, okay? You will, I'm going to offend you, okay? I'm, I'm not going to do it on purpose. I'm not going to mean to, but here you go. If I offend my wife, who I love more than I love you, of course I'm going to offend you at times. See, our church is a perfect place for imperfect people. It's a perfect place for imperfect people. So if you are perfect today, if you are perfect, get up out your chair. Run up out this place. Because we don't want to corrupt you with our imperfectionness. Okay? So, so, but we, but we, are, we are a perfect place for imperfect people. And following, and being in a Jesus-following community, it really will help you learn how forgiven you really are. It will help you. And, and what do I mean by that? See, we've all been saved by grace, um, not, not based on anything we have done, but because God forgives us time and time again. And when you are in a community with people, Jesus is teaching you how to love people, even the ones that drive you crazy. Actually, especially the ones who drive you crazy. The way Jesus is trying to teach us how to love people the way he does. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he loved people, hung out with people, spent time with people, ate and drank with people who were different than him. And here's one of the problems in our culture today, primarily because of social media. And I, keep, I keep picking on social media today, but I actually mean it. Um, primarily because of social media, we now have a delete or cancel culture. We have a delete or cancel, cancel culture. If someone does something that you don't like on your Facebook feed, you say to yourself, oh, I'm going to delete them. Boop. Look how powerful I am. Delete it that point. <laughs> and, and, then, and then if someone makes a bad decision, what do we do? Cancel them. Cancel them. And there is this false righteousness that is hidden within this demonic culture. See, how can we assume that we are righteous enough to cancel anyone? How can we assume that we are righteous enough to cancel people when Jesus canceled our debt on the cross? He canceled our sin on the cross. How are we to think that we can cancel other people? Here you go. Here you go. There is, there is justice. Now, there is justice for people's actions. But mercy, mercy always triumphs over judgment. Jesus says it like this. Luke 6, he says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be what? Forgiven. Forgiven. That's a Jesus principle. See, I'll say this. Some of the most difficult people in your life are there to remind you how much God has forgiven you. And, and expand your capacity to love. See, it's easy to love people who are nice to you. Jesus says even the, even, even the Pharisees do that. Jesus said even the bad people know how to love people who, 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 love, who, who love them. Anyone can do that. But to love people who are difficult, to love people who hurt you, forgive even when they never said sorry, that kind of love, that kind of love, that kind of love only comes from a daily connection to Jesus. You can't muster up that love. You can't self-will that love. You can't, you can't fake that love. But you can get connected to the heart of God. And when you understand the depths of God's love for you, man, you can begin to love them who are challenging. See, when you daily spend time with God, he teaches you that, that you forgive, you love, not because it will make the relationship better. The relationship may never be repaired. But by loving that person, you are becoming more like Jesus. You are becoming more like Jesus. And the spirit, and spiritual practices are ultimately there to help us become more like Jesus. Here you go. Even in conflict resolution. Conflict resolution at its heart is all about forgiveness. Learning to forgive each other and asking for forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 32 puts it this way. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as 
in Christ, God forgave you. This is some good stuff. This is powerful stuff. I want, you, I, want, I want to say this to you. If you currently have conflict with someone, go handle it. Now, I just feel the Holy Spirit very much saying, you've got to learn how to have healthy boundaries with people. Not everyone's a safe person. But I want you to know this. If that person isn't ready to move towards some kind of relational healing, that doesn't mean you have to stay stuck in prison. You can forgive from a distance. Okay? I want someone to know that. That's, that's a word for someone, okay? Maybe right now you, you allow bitterness and anger to get in, 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 inside your heart. And that's caused to even have disruptions in other relationships you have. One of the best ways we see the enemy at work is by seeing how he divides relationships. And one of the best ways we see God at work is seeing how he restores broken things. Here you go. Reason number three is this. Community is a good place for encouragement. Community is a good place for encouragement. There's so much negativity in the world, you will stick out like a sore thumb if you're good at encouraging people. There's just so much. When the other night, uh, we went to the smoke tree pool, um, community pool thing with my brother and his family. And I took my daughter Kingsley and, and, and I took my daughter Kingsley and my niece Nora and Bella to the two foot section. That's where I feel safe. <laughs> and uh, and Nora, Nora is a little bit older than the other two girls, and, and my niece Nora she's a little bit older, and she naturally took on this leadership role. So they're all swimming, and Nora's kind of telling them what to do <laughs> and and playing together. And then Nora also says, "Let's jump in the pool." She's like always on ten. She's hype all times. And and um. And so, and so they, they all excited, like, yeah, they all get out the pool, and they run to the edge, and Nora does a jump in, and Bella does a little jump in, and Kingsley gets to the edge, and then she's like, whoa. She's like, whoa, okay. And then all, I'm holding Jameson, and then all of a sudden, no, Hayden, I'm holding one of the kids. They a lot of them. I can't, I can't keep up with them. Did we bring them all to church? I don't know. Okay, yes, we did. Okay. Um, and, and Kingsley runs over to me, and she's like, she's, she's like can, you, can you catch me as I jump in? I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. So I go in the water. She jumps. I catch her. Then Nora goes up to her. She swims up to her. She's like, she's like Kingsley? Then she says like this, Kingsley, <laughs> you don't need your dad. Jump in. And, and then she's like, okay. And so they get out, and then Nora's like cheering her on, champion on, jump in. You got it. And then Kingsley jumps in. Then they end up having a blast. They jumped in for like an hour straight. Just doing the same thing over and over again. But here's the thing. This is what I want you to know. All of us, every single one of us, we need a Nora in our lives. We need a Nora in our lives. We need someone, when we get to the edge of things that we're afraid of, when we get to the edge that we don't think we can do it, and then we try to run to, 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 to do this, a handicap, we need a Nora in our lives that says, you got this. Jump in. You can do it. Because there's so much fear in our world. There's so much things that's telling you that you can't and you won't and you'll never. We need that person. See, Romans 12 to 15, 2 puts it this way. Our goal, I love this. Our goal must be to empower others to do what is right and good for them. I love this. And to bring them into spiritual maturity. See, make it your mission to be encouraging. Make it your mission. Like, I'd rather be annoyingly encouraging than negative. I'd rather, when I walk into a room, people be like, oh, man, what encouraging, what over-positive, encouraging thing is Jacob going to say today? Rather than they say, oh, gosh, this negative blood-sucking leech right here, you know? And I don't want, don't be a blood-sucking leech, people. Be someone who brings joy. Community matters because good community speaks to the God potential in people. It speaks to the God potential in people. See, what you say to people matter. What you say to your spouse matters. What you say to your kids, it matters. What you say to your friends or your co-workers or your classmates, to your barista, it matters. And sometimes what you don't say matters too. Not everything requires a response or a justification. Practicing silence and listening is one of those one of the best ways that we can actually speak. Jesus does this. There's a story about this, this woman who's caught in the act of adultery. And these religious leaders are really trying to trap Jesus. They don't even care about the woman in, in, in her condition. They grab her, throw her into the, to the middle of, of an open court area, and they wanted, to, they wanted Jesus to publicly cancel her on his Twitter account. 
at Jesus Christ, underscore. Don't follow that because I don't know if that's really a thing. Okay. And, and what happens in this story? Jesus, he says nothing. He doesn't say anything. But he bends down and he writes something on the ground. I don't know if he was trying to kill time and figure out what to do. I don't know if he wrote down the sin of every single person that was there accusing her. I don't know if he played tic-tac-toe. That was fun. But he says nothing. Then he speaks. And when he speaks, then the healing for this woman's life happens. See, friends, sometimes one of the best spiritual practices you can learn, you can practice one of the best things that you can practice to do is practice to shut up and listen and, the, and, and allow the person talking to you to speak and the Holy Spirit to speak to you while you're listening. See, get this. Your words either bring life to people or death to people. See, there's no middle. Proverbs 18, 21 says this. Your words are so powerful, they will kill or give life. So when, so when you encourage someone, you can speak directly into the God potential in that person. And what do I mean by that? I never let anyone say anything negative about my kids. I never let anyone. I, you, you won't happen. If, if you want to get a hook, say something negative about my kids. And, and I, even when they were baby babies, when, it, when Kingsley was a baby baby, uh, she was very, like most baby babies, she was very curious, always looking around, looking around. And this, and this one person, so sweet, just so sweet, you know, just, just nice, nice lady, said, oh, aren't you a nosy little one? And I said, skirt. <laughs> I said, no, she's not nosy. She's just, she's just curious. And I look right at Kingsley, little baby Kingsley. She's like, rah, rah, rah. you don't know what I'm saying. I look right at her and I said, stay curious. Stay, keep exploring this world. And you may be like, oh, that's overkill, Jacob. But I, I, I don't really care because too many people, if you allow it, people will speak negative things over you all the time. They, they, if, if you don't stand up for yourself or you don't stand up for people, People will speak negativity over you all, all the time. See, here's a crazy stat. The average toddler hears the word no 400 times a day. 400 times a day, there's a negative reinforcement happening. Now, this isn't a message about parenting at all, but I think there's a lesson to be learned. We naturally shut people down. We're naturally how people, and we're not wow people. I think Jesus was a wow person. Jesus is like, wow, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can change the world. You can make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He wasn't even worried about the how. He just said, wow, go do it. He was that kind of person. See, we naturally shut people down instead. Let's uplift people. Reason number four in Bethany, you can, you can make it spiritual up in here with your keys, okay? Reason number four, small groups bring healthy growth. Small groups bring healthy growth. See, good life change happens in the context of healthy relationships. Bad life change happens in the context of unhealthy friendship. I love how when you look at the life of Jesus, he was always making space for people. So he had his close group of people, but he was constantly making space for people to come in. And as we move forward as a church, we believe small groups or community groups are going to be an important aspect of our church the more we look at how the early church operated, how the early church thrived, how the early church was producing Jesus followers, we see a very tangible connection. And it was that people spent time together. People ate together. People celebrated the grace of Jesus in their lives, in their homes. There were small groups there connecting. And, and as we look into our world, wouldn't you agree that our world is so disconnected? It was so disconnected. People spend so much time on their devices, on social media. It has created this false sense of connection in our world. It's starving for authentic community. Starving for it. See, church, church is more than an hour-long gathering that we do on a Sunday morning. Church is not only a crowd gathered around the stage. But church is a community sharing life around a table. The local communities are the primary way that we practice the way of Jesus together here in Richmond. It's how we do it. That's why we open our small groups up this summer. It's a, it's a short semester for groups, 
But as we head towards revamping our group format in the fall, we see that community, you know, community together is so important. It's so important. As we follow Jesus, become disciples of Jesus, it is in small groups of people that we can develop meaningful friendships. And as a church family, we want to take time each week to eat together, pray together, share life together. It's in this ordinary rhythm of connection we can begin to become more than so I encourage you, even this semester, if you can, to get in a small group. If it's if you can only go one time, go one time. If you can go twice, go twice. If you can go all, all, all four times, do it. And I will, I will guarantee this. You will leave better than when you came. You will leave better than when you came. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The question I'll ask you to that verse is this. Are the people in your life making you sharper or do they make you dull? Here's my last reason is this. Reason number five. Community strengthens your relationship with Jesus. It strengthens your relationship with Jesus. Now there's this story in the Bible about a friendship that I think is a good example of the kind of church we want to be. Jesus is at a home and he's teaching about the kingdom of God and at this point, his ministry is beginning to grow. It, it, he's starting to gather bigger crowds, draw bigger crowds around him. Words getting around that, that, that God is using this Jesus to heal people. To, to, and they're, see, they're seeing all these breakthroughs happening. So people want to be near Jesus. And now there's these four friends who hear this. And they have one friend who's paralyzed. They have four friends who hear this and one friend who's paralyzed. And check this out. Luke 5, 15 says this. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to, let, to lie him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they gave up. Wait, they didn't say that. It says, they went up on the roof. Hold on, both that. Let me stop here. Four friends. One's paralyzed, all four of them carrying him on a mat. We don't even know how big this brother is. Could be a big dude. Where are they bringing him? Where are they bringing him? I'm going to say something here. The people in your life, the people around you, they're bringing you somewhere. They're bringing you somewhere. Do not be deceived that you can have people in your life and think they're not taking you somewhere. The people in your life are bringing you somewhere. The question I ask you today, where are they bringing you? Where do they bring you? Do they put you down? Do they bring you to places to help you hide your sin? To, do, to be negative? These friends you see in this story, they say they go to the house and it's busy. It's crowded. And they didn't give up. They didn't say, oh, maybe next time he rolls around town, we'll do it. They say, Let's get this dude on top of the roof. And then they carry this dude on top of a roof. I don't even like to climb up and put my Christmas lights on top of the, on top of the roof. They, they, put this, they put this man on top of the roof, and then they get on top of the roof. What do you do when they get on top of the roof? They're probably on top of the roof, and they're probably like, okay, what do we do now? Okay, we got him up here. What do we do now? And then one dude's like, let's bust a hole through this roof. And, it wasn't, and the conservative guys were like, I don't think we should do that. I mean, what about that? I mean, what if we got, we got to build it again if we bust a hole through the roof? And then the, then the other guy was like, nah, dude, this is bust a hole through this roof. And another one's like, okay, I got a hammer. And then the conservative guy was like, okay, I guess I'll do it, but I'm going to say you did it. And so guess what they did? They started busting a hole through the roof, busting a hole. And Jesus is teaching. And while Jesus is teaching, debris is falling on his face. He's trying to teach, and there's debris hitting him. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. Do you have people around your life that's willing to do something risky for you? Willing to bust a hole through a roof to get you to Jesus? To get you to the place where you need to be? Or do you have friends in your life that are just okay with you laying on a mat paralyzed? I'm going to tell you this. Who you hang, your, hang out with? Who you spend your time with? Show me your five best friends. Show me the five people you hang out with and I'll show you where you'll be in five years. Have people in your life that's willing to bust through the roof to get you to Jesus, to get you closer to him. And check this out, Texas, and as they lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins, your sins. 
sins, they're forgiven. Bust them through the roof. Bust them through the roof. Come on, can we imagine a church of authentic community, diverse community, not perfect by no means, but a community that comes together, celebrates the goodness of our Lord, and goes out and makes a Jesus. This is the community that we want. This is the community we desire. We don't want a social club. We're not the YMCA. We're not a gym. We're not a coffee shop. We're the local church, God. And we have a broken world out there. So God, help us. Help us lean into community. Help us encourage each other to become more like Jesus, to become more like you. Holy Spirit, I pray for healing for those who have been through relational hurt. Mm, I feel very strongly there's so much trust that's been broken. Holy Spirit, speak right to that person. Begin to chisel away at the brokenness there. you build a church with an authentic community following you. We ask for more of you and less of us. In Jesus' name. Amen.